the power of Native women. Usually when I am talking about Native history, it's usually something that's super duper depressing. But tonight, and excuse my French, we're going to celebrate some badass women in Native communities who have just done some amazing things. So um, I want to talk to you just a little bit first about the role of women in Native culture. Uh, they've always played an important role in Native communities. Many times women are in charge of gathering materials and then building the homes for everyone in the community. Women are the source of life. They are the center of the home and the heart of the nation. Um, they would oftentimes accompany their husbands on buffalo kills and uh, they would help after you know the buffalo was killed because uh, you can use the buffalo for everything. You use every single part of it. Um, in Eastern tribes, women were the originators of the longhouse system of government uh, in which they decided which men were to lead. And I would like to point out that the longhouse system of government is the same government that the United States modeled its government afterwards. So just so you know that, whoop. Um, <laughs> in Cherokee culture, women had freedom to own their own homes and could freely divorce whenever they wanted to. Uh, in some Native communities, fathers weren't actually thought of as being related to the children because the women ruled the home. Um, and they had control over how the children were raised. Council meetings were open to women, um, an idea that during colonization, colonists didn't understand because they didn't bring their women to the treaty talks, but we brought ours. Um, in Iroquois society, women were keepers. They were responsible for defining political uh, social and economic norms. Lineage was traced through the mother, not the father. So for example, um, I'm Oneida in Stockbridge, Muncie. So, and we are a uh, female led tribe. So my trace my ancestor ancestry through um, my mother who traces hers through her grandmother and so on and so forth. And because of that, they were turtle clan. So I am turtle clan. Um, so it follows your mom. Uh, women owned lands and planted crops. The Women's Council had the ability to remove any tribal uh, council member if they had an opinion that clashed with the views of the Women's Council. So they were very instrumental. So what I did tonight is I picked out a few, not a few, I picked out a lot, I picked out like 14. <laughs> um, because when you start, I just went down a rabbit hole. So I just kept finding all of these amazing women. And um, so I'm going to tell you a lot, a little bit about a lot of women. I will move quickly, not to bore you, but I also want to make sure you hear what I'm saying and who these women are and how they helped shape why you're sitting here in this room today. Because without these amazing women, who knows where we would have been. So, is this on? Haha. -ha. We're going to start with someone who's often misunderstood, and that's Pocahontas. Um, she was born near present day Jamestown, Virginia. She was the daughter of Chief Powhatan, who was the ruler or chief of the Powhatan Confederacy. When the colonists first came to Jamestown in May of 1607, um, that's where she kind of, uh, the Powhatan Confederacy kind of enters history. Uh, later that year, John Smith was captured by a hunting party that was led by Powhatan's brother. In 1608, when John Smith recounts that incident of him being kidnapped, Pocahontas is never mentioned in the story. What you learned in school lied. They lied to you. Your teachers lied to you. <laughs> she was never mentioned in his first recounting of the story of his capture. In 1616, however, John Smith is recounting the uh, story of his capture to Queen Anne. And that's where he mentions Pocahontas. She did not run up and throw herself over him and save his life like the Disney movie wants you to believe. It's lies, it's all lies. Um, <laughs> in 1613, Pocahontas was captured by the English. Uh, they tricked her by getting her to board a boat. And I wanna just take a step back and tell you that the first time Pocahontas enters history, not your history books, but enters your history, she's 10 years old, she's 10. She's not this voluptuous creature that they created on the animated screen. She's 10, right? So in 1613, she's captured by the English. She was held on this ship for about a year, and not a lot is actually known about her time there. 
There have been reports made through oral tradition, because that's how we passed down our history, is through oral, tradi oral tradition, that she was the uh, victim of repeated sexual assaults. This had been disputed, but it ends up showing up numerous times. So it keeps showing up over and over and over and over and over again. Um, during her time being captured by the English, she was taught English, and it's believed that's when she converted, whether through choice or by force, to Christianity. Um, she was baptized and given the name Rebecca. Before all of this uh, happened, though, oral history kind of also says that she may have been married before she was kidnapped and may have had a child, but we don't know that 110% for sure. Um, while she was held in captivity, she meets a guy named John Rolfe. John Rolfe, not John Smith, is who Pocahontas ends up marrying. Um, in April of 1614, they were married and they lived in Virginia for about two years. They had a son whose name was Thomas. Uh, he was born in 1615. Their marriage actually helped create a peace between the colonists and the Powhatan Confederacy, a peace that lasted eight years, and it was actually called the Peace of Pocahontas because it was so successful. It was decided that since there was this great peace, it was time to literally show Pocahontas off. So um, they, you know, they, she boarded a ship and they were traveling to England because they wanted to show, show how they tamed the savage. They wanted to show people in England how they tamed the savage. So they dressed her in English clothing. Um, all the pictures that you see of her are, uh, you know, how she was, it showed that they tamed her. They, you know, we can make these people civilized. And so that's what they wanted to do. They arrive in England on June 12th, 1616. She was paraded around as an Indian princess, even though she was not. She was the daughter of a chief, but she was not a princess because that's just not how things work. Um, her and Rolf lived in England for a time, and then in 1617, they boarded a ship to head back to Virginia. But the ship never made it out of the River Thames when she became ill. She was taken back to shore where she soon died. Uh, she succumbed to her illness. She was only 21 years old. She was buried at the cemetery of St. George's, but it isn't clear where exactly her grave is uh, because the church burnt down, records were lost, and her grave isn't marked. So they have no clue where she's at. She is a complicated and wonderfully misunderstood person. History does not do her justice, and I could spend an entire hour just talking about Pocahontas and all her major accomplishments um, that she did and how amazing she was. And But I wanted to spend a little bit of time on her because Disney got it wrong. The Disney movie got it wrong. I won't even let my nieces and nephews watch Pocahontas, the Disney movie, because I'm like, no. Um, so that is just a little bit about Pocahontas. Next, I want to tell you about Nancy Ward, beloved woman of the Cherokee. She is Cherokee, and she was born in what is present-day Tennessee. Uh, when she was growing up, uh, the Cherokee were facing invasions from Christian missionaries, which is kind of a story that happens throughout history, um, colonization, Christian, Christianization. Um, her uncle eventually allows the missionaries to come into the Cherokee territory as long as they build a school to teach the Cherokee youth English because a lot of times the only way uh, people thought that their native children could survive in a white man's world was to learn the language of the white man. So they're like, you can come with your missions, but you have to teach our kids English. When she was in her teens, she married a Cherokee man by the name of Kingfisher, and by the time she was 17, she had two children. She fought alongside her husband in battle uh, against the Creeks, and when he was killed, she picked up his rifle and helped lead the Cherokee to victory. So um, it was after this battle that she received the name Beloved Woman and was the only woman to be a voting member on the Cherokee General Council. She also became the leader of the Cherokee's Women Council. By the late 1750s, she married an Englishman by the name of Bryant Ward, and the two of them had a daughter. Uh, he would eventually leave and go back to South Carolina where uh, his first wife was. And <laughs> yeah, so he, was, like, he was shacking up with Nancy and then he went back to his first wife, um, and who was of European descent. Uh, after the American Revolution, Nancy became a de facto ambassador between the Cherokee and the white settlers. Uh, she, along with a group of Cherokee, met with an American delegation to discuss settlements along the Little Pigeon River. She expressed surprise that there were no women at this council, at this treaty negotiation. 
Um, and the Americans expressed their horror that she was there. <laughs> to counter this, Nancy said, quote, you know that women are always looked upon as nothing, but we are your mothers, you are our sons. Our cry is for peace, let it continue. This peace must last forever. Let your women's sons be ours, our sons be yours. Let your women hear our words. The girlfriend wasn't messing around. She was like, I'm here, this is why I'm here, and if it weren't for us, y'all wouldn't be here. Women, if it weren't for women, <laughs> you guys wouldn't be here. She died in 1822 in Tennessee at the inn that she had owned, and she was buried atop of a hill that kind of looked over the land, and this was the last remaining land that her people had before they were forced onto the Trail of Tears. Another woman that I find kind of often misrepresented in history is Sacagawea. She's awesome. I'm going to say all of these are my favorites because I'll be like, oh, this one's my favorite, but then I'll tell you about another one. I'll be like, this one's my favorite. So she was born in 1787 and grew up surrounded by the Rocky Mountains and the Salmon River region in what is present-day Idaho. In 1800, during a buffalo hunt, she was kidnapped by the Hidatsa tribe, who were enemies of the Shoshone. So she was Shoshone. Um, her capturers brought her back with them to present-day Bismarck, North Dakota. In 1803 or 1804, whatever the reason, she became the property, property, of Toussaint Charbonneau, who was at least 20 years older than her. They're not sure how she became his property. Could have been payment of a debt, um, but she eventually became his wife. And uh, one, I'm sorry, she eventually became one of his two wives, which I'm not judging, that's cool. And uh, she became pregnant. In 1803, the US acquired the Louisiana Purchase under Thomas Jefferson. Um, and after a year of planning and travel, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark reached the Hidatsa settlement. Sacagawea was six months pregnant by this time, but they immediately recognized the skills that Charbonneau had, but also the skills that Sacagawea had. She spoke not just Shoshone, but also Hidatsa. So she spoke two different languages, which are very hard to learn. Um, like, they're very different, they're complicated, but she knew both of them. On February 11th, 1805, she gave birth to her son, and on April 7th, she headed out with Lewis and Clark. So she did not have much of a recovery time. There was an incident that happened that earned her instant respect by this group. There was a, the boat that they were sailing on hit a squall, and it capsized. Charbonneau panics, you know, loses his marble, marbles. Sacagawea, though, was calm. And she gathered all the important materials, the maps, the tools, the journals, navigational items, captured them all, and they all made it safely to shore because of her thinking. Um, she, uh, uh, was ident she identified roots and plants and berries and what they could be used for. Yes, you can eat this. No, you can't eat that. Um, she navigated the mountains using the knowledge of the Shoshone trails she led the expedition. After reaching the Pacific, she and her husband and others returned back to the Hidatsa settlement. For his service, Charbonneau received 323 acres of land and $500.33. I don't know what the 33 cents was for, but that was his, his, winning, his uh, payment. Sacagawea received nothing. Um, in 1809, she and her family traveled to St. Louis to meet up with William Clark, who had, to, who had taken up farming, and he was going to have them take up farming as well. But that didn't really work out. In August of 1812, she gave birth to a daughter, but shortly after that, her health began to deteriorate. And she died on December 22nd, 1812. She is believed to be buried in Wyoming on the Wind River Reservation. They're not exactly sure. In the early 1900s, they set out on an expedition or a fact-finding mission to find out where she was buried. Um, his name escapes me at the moment. It'll probably come to me randomly at some other point. But there was a, a native doctor who set out on a mission to find where Sacagawea was buried. And he heard stories that kind of lined up with around the time that she died and where she would have been at the time of her death. So it is believed that she's on the Wind River Reservation. There's this woman buried there in an unmarked grave whose story is very similar to that of Sacagawea's, so she might be there. 
and that's a big reservation out in Wyoming. So it's, well, we might never know, but that's where we think that she is. Um, Sarah is an amazing person as well. She was born the daughter of a chief of the Northern Paiute, which is near present day Nevada. In the 1850s, she spent time in California where she lived with the family of Kiram Scott. And it was there that she learned the ways of the white world and she mastered the English language. She became an interpreter for the US Army and later she became a teacher at a reservation school in Oregon. In 1872, her tribe was forced to relocate to Eastern Oregon, and in 1878, when the Bangkok War broke out, she served as an army scout, a messenger, and secretly led her father's band of Paiute to safety away from an enemy camp. After the war, many Paiute left the area and were forced onto the Yakima Reservation in Oregon. Many died from disease and starvation, and because there were so many bodies, they were just thrown into the Columbia River. They all wanted one thing, and that was to return to their homelands of Nevada. Well, in 1879, Sarah started a lecture tour where she spoke about the plight of her people. She traveled to Washington, D.C. to try to help get her people back to Nevada. And at first, she received a promise that they were going to be able to return back. But by the time she got back to the reservation to deliver the message, that promise had already been rescinded. Uh, she, so to fight this, she organized her people in a passive resistance to being denied their homelands. She instructed them to literally do nothing. Don't farm, don't build houses, don't attend school, do nothing. Um, and eventually a small band were actually able to escape back to their homeland. Uh, she wrote and published a book called Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims. She worked tirelessly to make sure that her people were able to live on their promised land. However, in the end, promises were broken, and in 1883, she traveled and spoke over 300 times on the plight of her people. She died in 1891 in Idaho of tuberculosis, which was a common disease amongst the natives, but she, like right up to the day she died, she continued to keep fighting for her people. Okay, she might be my favorite. <laughs> Buffalo, actually, and I'm lying to you again, because she's like probably my top, but then there's another one later on that's my favorite. Buffalo Calf Road Woman is awesome. She was a young Cheyenne warrior. She was instrumental at the Battle of the Rosebud, and it was during this battle that she was actually able to save her brother from death. She, but where she really became instrumental and known for was the Battle of Little Bighorn. She fought alongside her husband, Black Coyote. It is said that she is the one that struck the blow that knocked Custer off of his horse. We all know what happened after that. So, go girl. <laughs> um, and I have talked about her down in Monroe. And if you don't know, Monroe is Custer's hometown. So, all right, that's right. I brought the truth. Um, <laughs> This was actually confirmed, this story was actually confirmed in 2005 when the Northern Cheyenne broke their silence about the battle and publicly recounted the battle from their oral history. And she's mentioned in it. So, woo! Uh, though I don't condone violence, but um, <laughs> she, uh, after surrendering to the U.S. Army, her and her husband and children were moved to the Southern Cheyenne Reservation, which is uh, present-day Oklahoma. She and her family were part of the Northern Cheyenne Exodus, which was a breakout from the Oklahoma Reservation, back to their homelands in Montana. Along the journey, her husband ended up killing a military officer. He was found guilty, and he was arrested, and he was awaiting trial. While he was in prison, though, Buffalo Calf Road Woman uh, died of diphtheria in May of 1879. And when her husband heard about her passing, he then took his own life. She didn't uh, live to see her people um, finally being able to settle on their homelands in Montana. But during her short life, she accomplished a lot, one of which was her uh, fighting at the Battle of Little Bighorn, which is what she's most known for. Um, Susan LaFleche is really cool, too. They're all really cool. She was born on the Omaha Reservation in Nebraska. I actually just listened to a podcast about her. The podcast is uh, Stuff They Never Told You in History Class. 
Look it up, type in her name, it's really good. Uh, she was the daughter of the tribe's chief, Joseph Lafleche, Lafleche, also known as Iron Eyes. When she was younger, she witnessed the death of a native woman because a white doctor refused to treat her. That altered Susan's view greatly about what she was gonna end up doing with her life. Because of that, she went on to become the first Native American woman doctor. She graduated from the Women's Medical College in Pennsylvania, of Pennsylvania in 1889. She had a lot of lucrative offers come her way, uh, you know, to work in very prestigious hospitals. And if you work on the East Coast, that's very prestigious anyways. I mean, New England is like the place to be. But she turned them all down. She traveled back to her reservation because that's where she wanted to be. She wanted to serve her people. She traveled around and provided care for all those living on the reservation and addressed many health issues on the reservation. Um, she promoted modern sanitary standards and advocated for temperance of her people. If you're not familiar with temperance or the temperance movement, that is the um, abolishing of alcohol. They get rid of it because alcohol can make you do crazy things. There was a whole temperance movement that resulted in the passing of prohibition. And Susan knew that uh, alcoholism was a huge issue on the reservations amongst Native people, a disease that actually uh, uh, took her husband as well. So it was something that was very close to her. So she advocated for temperance. Um, when she had, she did a lot of things. She worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Department of the Interior. She was the doctor that everybody wanted to come and see because she knew you, she knew your family. She, she was very uh, trusted. One of her big dreams was to have a hospital built on this reservation so where the people didn't have to travel very far. And before she died, she was actually able to see that dream come true um, where the hospital was opened. She died in Bancroft, Nebraska on September 18th, 1915, and she was buried right next to her husband. So um, I thought she was really cool. Again, there was a really great podcast on her that goes way more into depth, but it's, she was really awesome. Eliza Burton Conley was a member of the Wyandotte Nation in Kansas. From a young age, she was encouraged by her parents to get an education, so she did. And in 1902, she graduated from the Kansas City School of Law and became the first woman admitted to the Kansas Bar and the first to argue a case before the United States Supreme Court. Ooh. I thought about going to law school and I took the LSAT and I was like, yeah, that's enough. Um, <laughs> no, I took the LSAT twice. I did that to myself twice, I don't know why. Um, in 1855, the U.S. government deemed that the Wyandot were fit to become citizens. That's an interesting thing to be deemed. So prior to 1924, and I would like to point out that yesterday was the anniversary of the Citizenship Act being signed. In 1924, the United States signed, this, the President of the United States, who was Calvin Coolidge, signed the Citizenship Act, which granted citizenship to Native Americans, because we weren't citizens before that. But we fought in all your wars, but we were not citizens before that. One way you could get, there were a couple of different ways you could get citizenship prior to that. Military service, or uh, women marrying, you know, uh, a Native woman marries a white man, she becomes a citizen. Another way was for the government to actually deem you civilized, and then you became citizens. It was also a nifty little way to liquidate your reservation land. It was very, very, there's loopholes and red tape everywhere. So in 1855, the Wyandotte were deemed eligible for citizenship and their land was divided amongst the members, but there, were, but there was a little bit of tribal structure left in place. Um, and they retained legal authority over a cemetery that they had. Now this is important. In 1906, the Wyandotte of Oklahoma approved the sale of the cemetery for development. Eliza and her sisters were like, no, 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 no. They disagreed with the sale of the cemetery. They ended up making like a shack, pretty much. And they sat outside the cemetery on, on 24 hour shifts, watching it to make sure that nobody would come in. Because you know, native women, we don't play. This is what we do. Um, she took up the cause of protecting Native American cemeteries and worked tirelessly to have them protected under federal law. They weren't protected under federal law at this point. In 1907, she filed a petition in the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Kansas 
to protect the cemetery from sale. Her petition was denied. She went all the way to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court also ruled against her as well. Um, and they ruled in favor of the lower courts. It was basically going to take an act of Congress at this point to save this. Finally, in 1913, Congress repealed the bill that would have allowed the sale of the cemetery. She died on May 28, 1946, and she was buried in the same cemetery that she fought so hard to protect. Because of the work that she did in the early 1900s, that led to the passage in the 1990s of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and later um, other acts that are helped to protect Native American sites. So because of her sitting outside of a cemetery for 24 hours a day and going all the way to the Supreme Court, we have protection over our rights. And actually, NAGPRA, which is like the little name for it, was invoked during Standing Rock as well, because that pipeline not only was coming under the Missouri River, but it was going through a burial site. So that's why there was a whole big to-do other than oil should stay in the ground. It was going through a cemetery. So that's her. Laura, Laura Cornelius Kellogg. She's my people. She's Oneida. I touched my microphone. I'm sorry. She was born on the Oneida Reservation in Green Bay in 1880. Yes, I am a Packers fan. My husband is a Lions fan. We're a house divided. It's all right. She studied, <laughs> she studied at Barnard, Cornell, NYU, Stanford, and the University of Wisconsin, but she never actually got a degree. She just liked going to school. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, I like going to school too, but I want like a finished product at the end. I want that piece of paper, but. Um, she was fluent in Oneida, Mohawk, and English, and she became one of the founding members of the Society of American In Indians. She was a voice for the Oneida and the Six Nations. The Six Nations are the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, and she spoke on sovereignty, land, and treaty rights. In 1914, she and her husband actually moved to Washington, D.C. to lobby full-time for the rights of Native Americans. And not only did she do work for the Oneida, but she also became involved with the Blackfeet, the Brothertown, the Stockbridge Muncie, the Osage, and the Huron, and that's just to name a few. And, and it, was all, it all had to do with land sovereignty and treaty rights. In 1919, she appeared before the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the UN, calling for justice for the American Indian. In uh, 1922, she was instrumental in the land claims case placed by the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin in New York. So the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin wanted to lay claim to some of our homelands in New York, and she was instrumental in helping us start that case. The case was lost at that time later throughout history and more attorneys, we do end up, we do have land claims in New York, um, but it brought up the issue of land claims and relocated tribes. So through our migration west, we were forced to give up our lands in the east, but we were like, those are still our homelands. We have rights to those, we have ancestors there, we want those. So it brought up that issue and that's what she was very instrumental in. She worked tirelessly for sovereignty and land rights literally up to the day that she died, and she passed in 1947. Mary Golda Ross was born in Oklahoma in Indian Territory, and she was the great-granddaughter of Cherokee Chief John Ross. If the name John Ross sounds familiar to you, um, that's because he was the chief that helped lead uh, some of the Cherokee during the Trail of Tears. So he was very, he was like the last holdout. He was like, we're not leaving. You have to leave. So then he, after forced, he was the one who helped lead some of his people. She earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics in 1928 at the age of 20. And later, in 1938, she earned a master's in astronomy from Colorado State Teachers College. She taught math and science in rural Oklahoma for nine years during the Great Depression. At age 28, she took a civil service exam to work for the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and she was assigned to advise the girls at Santa Fe Indian School. In 1941, at the urging of her father, she moved to California to uh, work after the U.S. joined World War II. In 1942, she was hired as a mathematician and worked on preliminary designs for space travel and orbiting satellites. 
Yay, science. After, she, after that, after the war, so after World War II ends, um, she went to UCLA and earned a professional certificate in engineering. She became the first Native American woman engineer. In 1952, she started work on preliminary designs for interplanetary space travel. She worked on the Agena rocket project and on preliminary design concepts for flyby missions to Venus and Mars. When she retired, she worked with Native American youth, primarily young girls, to encourage a love of math and science. Um, when she was 96 years old, wearing traditional Cherokee regalia, she participated in the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. And upon her death in 2008, she actually left a $400,000 endowment to the museum. So she was really cool. And the fact that like, she worked on science stuff, she's my husband's favorite, because he's all about that. So. <laughs> Okay, so she's probably like my uber favorite only because I've met her in real life and um, I have a picture with her and I almost wanted to put it up there but I didn't want to seem too conceited and full of myself. So I didn't, I just put a picture of Miss Ada up there all by herself. Um, Ada was born on the Menominee Reservation in Wisconsin in 1935. Her mother was a strong advocate for native rights even though her mother was not native. She was a nurse, a reservation nurse, but she was still she still advocated for the people that she worked for. And Ada followed in her footsteps. Um, she was the first member of the Menominee Nation to graduate from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And in 1961, she was the first Native American to receive a master's in social work from Columbia University. She worked tirelessly to end termination and helped have the Menominee, rest, uh, Menominee Nation restored. Uh, if you're not familiar, termination was a policy that the United States put into effect in 1953. Uh, and basically what it did is it terminated tribal status. So you were no longer a federally recognized tribe. You were just a regular Joe Schmo walking down the street. And so that terminated federal contracts, grant monies that was coming in to save schools, health clinics, schools and health clinics closed. Poverty on reservations was already high. It went higher. Termination backfired. It was, they were supposed to, the government saw it as a way to help build us up. And all it did is it brought us down even lower because now we were having to do things that we hadn't had to do before. For example, pay taxes on the land that you lived on your entire life. Property taxes were non-existent because it was a reservation. It was federally owned land. So uh, Ada, was in the process of trying to go to law school, but then realized that coming back to the reservation was gonna be the best way that she could help her people. So she was instrumental in having the uh, 1972 Menominee Restoration Act signed, and it was actually one of the last things Nixon did before he had to leave office, was restore the Menominee tribe. And so she worked on the Menominee Restoration Committee, which was the first uh, governing body after termination. And so because of that, because she was chair of that committee, she was the first woman to actually chair the Menominee tribe as a whole. So that was very important. Prior to that, their uh, patriarchal tribe, and Ada was the first woman to lead it. Um, she served, <laughs> I just told you that, she was the first woman to lead the Menominee, huh? In 1992, she was the first Native American to run for Congress from Wisconsin. She lost her race, but she had a better job waiting for her. In 1993, after she lost her race, she was the first woman to ever be appointed to Assistant Secretary of the Interior as head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, and in 2000, she headed up the American Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I can tell you, uh, I speak to Ada not fairly regularly, but pretty often. She's still very active in Native causes, she makes me tired when I'm on the phone with her, when she's telling me about everything that she's doing, and she's well into her 80s, and I'm not. But she's, uh, she, she's exhausting, and she just, uh, she's just so active still. And actually, just this past year, the University of Wisconsin-Madison instituted a program called an Elder in Residence Program. And what it, did, it, what it does is it has an elder come onto um, campus for about a week, they hold regular office hours like a regular professor would, but they're there for support and encouragement to the Native students on campus. And I think that's huge. Ada was the first uh, elder to come onto campus 
uh, in the institution, instituting of that program back in October. She's very, um, she's really awesome, and I love her. And I'm uh, actually in Wisconsin a lot more often now, so I'm really excited to be able to work with her some more. Wilma Mankiller, other than having an awesome name, she was pretty awesome too. <laughs> she was born on the Cherokee Reservation in Oklahoma. She's the sixth of 11 children. When she was 11 years old, her family left the ancestral lands and moved to California, and it was there that she first, you know, got bit by the little activist bug. In 1963, she married, and the marriage was a little bit difficult. Um, then in 1969, the occupation of Alcatraz happened, and that changed her life forever. Um, she wanted to get involved, and her husband wanted her to remain a traditional wife. Uh, more of a traditional wife. Um, and so she said that when Alcatraz happened, she knew what she was meant to do. Indians had rights, and she was going to let the world know it. So in 1977, she divorces her husband, and she moves back to Oklahoma, and she embraces the Cherokee vision of being in good mind, and she embraces the traditional ways again. So she kind of goes back to the, the, her roots and takes in everything. Um, she helped organize an effort uh, in the community of Bell, Oklahoma. The community was run down. It was poor. There was no running water. And the residents really, it was so isolated, the residents there still spoke Cherokee, which is not a bad thing. But this is how rural and isolated it was. Um, she managed to have an 18-mile-long water system put in and have dangerous housing conditions repaired. In 1985, she became the first woman principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, and she held that office until 1995. Her administration oversaw the revival of tribal schools on the reservation, and the population increased, which means people were coming home, which is so good, because that uh, people coming home population increase is very good and transformed nation-to-nation -nation relations. So now we're interacting with nations. You know, the United States interacts with, you know, France and England and Canada and Mexico. Well, we don't really interact with Mexico. We like to tell Mexico what to do. Um, she wanted to do the same thing with relations between nations, na uh, native nations. She focused on health care and building health clinics, put in an ambulance system that was not there on the reservation before, and job training for her people. She brought in retail, restaurants, and bingo operations. What does that create? That creates jobs. That's awesome. She worked tirelessly to combat misappropriations of native cultures. So all the things that you see happening at Coachella, she was fighting against it. You know, you don't just wear headdresses to wear headdresses. They have meaning. Those feathers mean something. We're not mascots. Wilma was doing all of this before it was cool. In 1998, she was awarded the Medal of Freedom, and sadly, she died in 2010 of pancreatic cancer, but everything that she put in place remains and keeps going forward. She was bringing her nation forward, and that was the most important. Eloise Colbell, she was known as Yellow Bird Woman. She was born in 1945 on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. She grew up on her parents' cattle ranch, because cattle ranching is really big out there. And like many homes on the reservation, they didn't have running water or electricity. She attended Great Falls Business College and Montana State University, but had to leave because her mother was ill, and so she left to take care of her mother. After living in Seattle and marrying, she and her husband moved back to the Blackfeet Reservation to help her father with the ranch, and there she became the treasurer for the tribe. She founded the Blackfeet National Bank, which was the first national bank located on a reservation and owned by a Native American tribe. In 1997, because of that, she won the MacArthur Genius Grant for her work with the bank and Native financial literacy. So not only did she start and operate this bank, but she taught financial literacy to um, the, those living on the reservation. It was during her time that she was treasurer of the tribe that she started to notice discrepancies in the management of funds being held in trust by the federal government for individual Native Americans. So if you don't know, we all have like, I guess, bank accounts with the treasury. Um, so there's like one for Cherokee and the Lakota and the Oneida and you know, all of that. And that's where our money is being held. And it's managed by the federal government. When things are managed by the federal government, that can only mean one thing, disaster. <laughs> the, 
These particular funds that were being held were derived from fees that the government had collected for Indian trust land that was leased for lumber, oil production, grazing, gas, and mineral rights. So um, it's kind of like a, like a lease program, like, oh, there's oil on your land. Can we drill? Yes, you can for a price, and you have to like pay uh, like royalties or rent, so to speak. The government was supposed to pay the royalties to the owners of the, na the native owners of the land. Over some time, though, the accounts became a bit more complicated because original land trusts were divided amongst descendants. So what happened is like somebody would have a piece of land and then they would pass on, and then let's say they had you know 300 acres, but they had three kids. So now they take that 300 acres and they passed and they divided amongst their three kids. Well, now each kid has 100 acres. And the same thing, they you know each have X amount of kids and it keeps passing down. So the land keeps getting smaller and smaller and the royalties keep getting mixed up as to who's supposed to get what. So they say. <laughs> Eloise had discovered that the owners of the land were not being paid the amounts that they were owed. She started to work diligently to make sure that the owners of the land were paid what they should be paid. In 1996, she filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of all of those who were not being paid. The court case was called uh, Colbell versus Salazar. Salazar was the um, Secretary of the Interior at the time that the suit was filed. It wasn't until 2009 when we had Barack Obama in office um, that a settlement was finally reached and that was actually one of the first things that he did was uh, the first things that he signed was a settlement. And, uh, and Congress passed an appropriation bill of $3.4 billion, which was only a fraction of what was actually owed because these records that Eloise found went back decades upon decades upon decades, like some well into the 1800s. So you know $3.4 billion, even though it's a lot of money, it wasn't the correct amount. And that was actually, um, that had to be fought for uh, in the uh, Committee on Indian Affairs. And at that time, John McCain was head of that, uh, um, head of that committee. And I have mad respect for John McCain and his military service. We disagree politically. Um, and I don't really like what the current administration is doing regarding his name and his memory. But dude got it so wrong on this. Um, where it, the, he would fight back with, the, the, with Eloise and say, well, we're going to give you this. And she was like, no, you're not. You're going to give us this because this is what we're owed. So mad respect for Senator McCain, but on this issue, he was very much in the wrong. Um, lands were restored back to a reservation status with this appropriations bill, and uh, the... Uh, appropriations bill also provided a $60 million scholarship fund that would be used for children to be able to go into school. It was actually, it's actually now called the Eloise Cobell Scholarship Fund. Um, she died on October 16th, 2011 of cancer. She's actually wasn't able to participate in like the, um, the last uh, little bit of negotiations before this. And she passed just before the first uh, checks were mailed out, and they were actually called the Cobell checks. And so she passed just before that. But she was actually sick for a very long time, so a lot of people say that she kept going a little bit longer just to make sure the case was finished. So the, the resilience of the Native woman. Um, Winona LaDuc, love me some Winona. I would like, I'm like total fangirl. Like I wouldn't stalk her like dangerously. Um, <laughs> And this is being recorded, so. <laughs> I wouldn't stalk her dangerously, but I would really want to meet her. <laughs> uh, she was born in LA in 1959. She's a citizen of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation in uh, Minnesota. She attended Harvard, where she earned her undergraduate degree in rural economic development. And in 1982, um, she, uh, it, in 1982, she earned her degree. And she also became involved in Native activism. She moved to the White Earth uh, Reservation after she graduated, and she worked as a principal at a school there for a little bit of time. Later, through um, not online courses, because it wasn't online, but like distance learning, she earned a master's degree in community economic development. 
And while she was working on the White Earth Nation, that activism bug that bit her when she was in Harvard came back. And she, in 1985, helped found the Indigenous Women's Network and worked with uh, women of all red nations. And their acronym is WARN. I like that, WARN. Uh, to help bring issues to light, such as the forced sterilization of Indigenous women and missing and murdered Indigenous women. She also became involved in land recovery for Native nations and helped found the White Earth Land Recovery Project in 1989 uh, with the goal of buying back land that had been taken illegally. So she, start, she worked a lot with White Earth because that is obviously her homeland, but she does work with other nations as well. In 1993, she helped found Honor the Earth, which is an organization that focuses on Native environmental issues and the stopping of pipelines. Um, in 1996 and in 2000, she was the vice presidential nominee for the Green Party, held it head by Ralph Nader. I actually did not know that, and I was like, maybe if I would have known that. No, just kidding. I couldn't vote in 2000, so um, <laughs> I wasn't old enough. Um, in 2016, she became greatly involved in the protests at Standing Rock. She was out there. Um, there's many interviews that she did about Standing Rock. And uh, you can find, like, I know she did a really good interview with Amy Goodman of Democracy Now!, so that was really good. She has also recently started, not recently, it's been over a year now, I think, uh, a hemp growing farm on the White Earth Reservation that is dedicated to growing hemp from all around the world, along with vegetables and tobacco, because hemp can be used for so many different things. I mean, you can make stuff with hemp, baskets and rope and all of that. Um, and it could be pr a proven moneymaker for tribes. So we can get some economic sovereignty, you know, along with food sovereignty from hemp. And uh, yeah, so that's what she's doing really now. I think they're actually getting ready to harvest their first uh, batch of hemp, which is really cool. And I know other nations are looking forward to it, uh, looking, you know, to see how things go with that, to see what they want to do. Um, the next two women, just really quick, I don't have them up here because. I didn't update my slide, and this happened afterwards. But uh, Sharice Davids from Kansas, who is a citizen of Ho-Chunk, first Native American woman elected to Congress woo, in the past women's wave that we just had. Deb Halland, New Mexico, Laguna Pueblo, was also, uh, Sharice Davids was one of the first, because there were two that we elected in 2018. So Deb Halland, Laguna Pueblo, uh, was elected to uh, Congress as well. She actually recently, um, not maybe, what month am I in? It's June. So I think February, she was the first Native American woman to sit in the speaker's chair and oversee a debate, which was really, really cool. Um, Cheyenne proverb that I really like, um, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Then it's finished no matter how brave its warriors or how strong their weapons. So this just, just goes to prove the power of women, um, Native women and women in general, absolutely. Um, the first uh, protest camp at Standing Rock was founded by a grandmother in her 80s and her grandchildren. So women led the fight at Standing Rock and we lead the fight everywhere. Um, just because I know people like to look up their own things, an indigenous people's history of the United States is an amazing book to read. It's by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She is a professor out of Oklahoma. It's eye-opening. It's like Howard Zinn, but like the indigenous version. So it's really good. Um, Lakota Woman is written by Mary Crodog. Mary Crodog was an uh, activist during the occupation of Wounded Knee. She actually gave first birth to her first child at Wounded Knee. Um, and she was uh, married in the Indian way to Leonard Crodog, who was a spiritual leader during the American Indian movement. Um, Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock is a documentary you can find on Netflix, and it talks about, the, uh, about Standing Rock, about the protests that were happening, um, the water protectors, and it's just a really good way to uh, get a little bit more insight into Standing Rock. And finally, 100 Years is also on Netflix, and that is about the um, Eloise Cobell and the lawsuit that she filed against the United States to get these monies for uh, these mismanaged monies for uh, several different Native nations, not just the Blackfeet Nation, but Navajo as well, were also suffering from mismanagement of funds as well. So that is just a little bit, 100 years is really good. It's not long, it's maybe like an hour and 10 minutes. I could be lying to you, it could be longer. Um, it was just so good, it doesn't seem like it's that long. 
Um, so that those are just the little things, and I appreciate you guys coming out on such a gorgeous day because I feel like summer's finally coming to Michigan. Yay! And um, I will take any questions that you have, um, whether it's about this, whether it's about anything else, native related, because um, I do talk about a whole bunch of other things. There is not a question that you can ask that's offensive. The only offensive question is the question that you don't ask and just walk out assuming that you know. So um, I thank you guys for listening, and I'm open to anything that you have to say. Thank you so much. Anything? Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the occupation of Alcatraz? Because I've heard about that, um, but I don't really know the details of what was going on. Like, it was in the late 60s? It's, OK, so it's like 1969 to 1971. It was a long time. Okay. We like held that island for a while. Yeah, right. OK, so everyone, uh, uh, so in a nutshell, and like, let's see if I can do this in 30 seconds. Time me. Don't time me. It'll be longer. Um, Alcatraz was a prison before. Uh, you can actually go on tours of it now, supposedly. I don't know. I've never been. But um, prior to that, there, uh, the Native nations in the San Francisco Bay Area wanted a place where they could um, have, you know, like a cultural center, school, museum, kind of uh, basically just a cultural center to embrace their culture. And Alcatraz was up for sale at this time. The U.S. government was trying to sell it because it was closed. What was it going to be? Um, and so they, a group of, like, eight or so organizations, including the American Indian Movement, AIM, came in and they were like, OK, well, this would be a great place for this to happen. And they lobbied for it, and they just weren't getting it. And so they were like, hey, you know what? Like 100 bazillion years ago, uh, settlers came over and claimed the United States on right of discovery. Why don't we just go do the same thing with Alcatraz? <laughs> and so. They, uh, about like 80 people got in a boat and they sailed to Alcatraz and they, um, they claimed it in the right of discovery. And they said, this is what we want to do with it. And you know, we're not leaving until we get it. Um, they, it, it was kind of really well organized. There was, they set up like a little nursery school, they set up a daycare center, they set up a health clinic. They even had a police force that they called the um, Bureau of Caucasian Affairs that would patrol the island, <laughs> like, true story, true story, that would patrol the island, you know, just to make sure, um, you know, supplies were sent in and things like that. And they, you know, there was some graffiti up there. It was uh, like, you know, it was like peace and love and, you know, welcome and, you know, this is Indian land and Custer had it coming and it was all sorts of things. There's a picture, you can find it in Google, and it says Custer had it coming. And so it was, um, they were basically, they wanted it. Now, they, the, the part I find the funniest is that the, the organizers offered to buy Alcatraz for $24 in glass beads and some red cloth, <laughs> which is what they got for Manhattan. The government didn't accept the offer, and I don't know why. Um, but so this went on for two years, and... Um, they, what, there were obviously other things that happened, and I do an entire lecture on it, but they uh, finally citing the need to fix like a, a fog horn or a light. The government came on the island and kind of just like shut it down. But it went until 1971, and that kind of helped spark protests that happened in other parts of the country at Mount Rushmore, which is located in the Black Hills which is uh, sacred to the Lakota. That's where they believe the Great Spirit resides. So it's like your church. Um, and then they put Mount Rushmore up there. What? And uh, there were protests at the Mayflower and at Plymouth Rock. And so then that spurs into 1973 with the occupation of Wounded Knee. And it just keeps going on and on and on. I'm sorry, 1972 with the Trail of Broken Treaties, then Wounded Knee. And then it just keeps going. So that was Alcatraz. It kind of just started it all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, what is the Indian? affiliation with the Great Lakes Commission with uh, these states organized to protect the Great Lakes, the water sources there. Are there Indians on the commissions there along with the governors and state officials like of Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan, all these uh, states around there? Is there Indian representation there? I think there is. Yeah, Jasmine, do you know? 
I'm going to defer to my girl Jasmine. <laughs> so um, actually there is for some of the treaty lands across Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, and Upper Michigan, um, there's an organization called the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which works yes. hand in hand with each state's Department of Natural Resources and the state to kind of uh, negotiate um, hunting, gathering, fishing on our city territories and to provide some input on some issues like uh, mining and that sort of thing. So many, much of the work that they do is to create baselines in case things were to change and that way we could prove that our lands and our territories have been negatively impacted by mining, air pollution, and many of our tribes now are working to um, create our own air quality control and water control standards. Yes. And so, and ho in hopes that we could use that in order to fight these environmental dangers. So any support that you all can offer us on behalf of, of saying, yep, we think that you guys should have control over your air quality on your reservation and your seated territory and water control. We would very much appreciate that. Yeah, actually, and just to add to that, I know when the U.S. backed out of the Paris Climate Agreement, um, there were states that opted in. The same thing has also happened with Native nations. There are Native nations that are working on their own climate agreements to kind of mirror the Paris Climate Agreement. So we can, again, as Jasmine said, have clean water, clean air, uh, clean vegetation. You need to have clean vegetation in order to make sure the wildlife is safe because there is still hunting and fishing that happens on our lands, whether it's our lands or ceded lands. So, good question. Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Charbonneau. Indian tribes are there in Michigan? 12. 12, 12 federally recognized. I, I specify that as federally recognized because that's how many the uh, United States recognizes. So there's 537 total, but we know that there's more than that because there's a process you have to go through in order for the government to recognize you. So in order to get like grants, grant funding uh, for your clinics, for your schools, government contracts. So if the government doesn't recognize you, then you're not counted. But there are 12 federally recognized in the state of Michigan. Any other questions? Thank you guys so much for coming out. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you guys. Thank you. This program was recorded on June 3rd, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.